when you look across the spectrum, all assets have dramatically inflated. In 2008, in response to the great financial crisis, the Federal Reserve embarked on an extremely unorthodox financial experiment, quantitative easing. They wanted to reflate the housing market, goose the stock market. They wanted Americans to feel wealthier. And if Americans feel wealthier, they'll spend more. And if they spend more, the theory went, it would rev up the economy. You know, quantitative easing is a perverse form of government interference. It creates a tremendous amount of distortions in the market. It started this stock market on a tear to where we've ended up most recently at a 5,000 year high. And not only a sovereign bond bubble, but also a stock market bubble. In the pest control industry, we have benefited tremendously from that bubble that's blown. What is a bubble? It's a fantastic story and a shitload of liquidity. Well, we got liquidity from the courtesy of the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Department of the Treasury. The government putting everything on a credit card. And of course, we've got the great story, right? Pest control is recession resilient. It's desirable. It's essential and all those sorts of things. And here we have it. During COVID, these governments overcooked it. They created a spectacular amount of money. They created a tremendous fiscal impulse to pay people to sit at home, smoke and pop, playing video games, buying Bitcoin, buying AMC, buying luxury watches, buying jewelry, buying houses. We saw the Federal Reserve buying billions upon billions of dollars in mortgage-backed securities. That's when things really started to go crazy. In November of 2021, we saw transaction multiples eclipse 30 times nominal EBITDA and north of five times revenue. So effectively, we printed money in Q4 of last year. Exactly what we said would happen last summer in Supernova. Welcome you to Bubble Trouble, M&A in the year of Fed tightening. I'm Patrick Baldwin, and I'm here with my longtime friend and advisor, Paul Giannamore. Thank you, Patrick. Paul, welcome to the boardroom. I appreciate it, bud. Hey, Supernova was just less than a year ago. I really want to know, what's different? What, what's new? Why are we going from M&A and the late stages of the pest control consolidation boom now today, Bubble Trouble? Yeah, you know, Patrick, a ton has happened since Supernova. Right. I mean, we had in Supernova, we did it in June. We had that massive spike between the middle of the year until the end of the year. The reason why we're doing bubble trouble is a little bit different. We are in a very different time than we were just shy of a year ago. And today I'm going to give this talk. It's a discussion, really, and it's more somebody as a fellow investor than an M&A advisor. I mean, like you, uh, my primary focus is protecting my family's financial future. That's number one. And I think all business owners think about it that way. Number two, I need to make sure that I provide my clients the absolute best advice that I can. And in order to do that, I, you know, I toil in the M&A vineyards every day and I'm a student of financial history. So one of the things that we're going to talk about today is really framing up 
how right now in 2022, it's almost the mirror opposite in a lot of ways of where we were in 2021. 2021, we were in a speculative frenzy. Now in 2022, we've reversed that. Everything that took place over the last 13 years from an asset price perspective, government policymakers supporting asset prices has been flipped on its head. And so I think now more than ever, you as a business owner need to be vigilant of that. And, and this is the sort of discussion that I wanna have with you today. First off, I come into this space not as a pest control guy, and sometimes I wish I was because I've got a nasty app problem that I haven't been able to eradicate. I have pest control services myself. I've tried everything from baiting to sprays, you name it, I can't get the job done. But I, you know, I come into this with an investment banking background. I started my career in the early 90s out in Silicon Valley. I sat across the table from Michael Dell and Steve Jobs. Now granted, I was carrying books and grabbing coffee. But that's where I started my career and then I went into private equity. I worked for the largest private, publicly traded private equity firm in the world at the time and focused on a lot of roll-up activities similar to what Anti-CMX does in the market, similar to what Thompson Street Capital Partners does. So that's the frame that I come from. And you know, my, my thought process today is to not try to predict anything per se. I'm not gonna predict stock market crashes and so on and so forth. But I really want to talk to you about how I believe that you should be thinking about these current events. And I know that a lot of you really aren't thinking too much about it. And I know that because I talk to you every day. So you know, over the course of today, we're gonna to go through a lot of different data. We're gonna lay out a couple different theses. Um, we've got some great guests that'll be joining us on the second half of this program. Um, but for now, one of the things that I really want you to think about is if you own a pest control business, you own, or whether it's a pest control business or a publicly traded equity, the, you own a claim on future cash flows. So your wealth really is future cash flows. And the value of your business is nothing more than the current price. Right? It's the current price of that future cash flow. And just like the stock market goes up and down every day, the market can dramatically underprice your asset or overprice your asset. But really all that you have is, again, your wealth is the current price of that future cash flow. And, you know, we've lived in an era where over the last 13 years, policymakers have done everything in their power to not only create the wealth effect by juicing up the stock market, reflating the real estate market, and they've also tried pretty damn hard to create inflation. And as we can see in 2022, they're finally successful. So, you know, as I think back over the last 13 years, everything that policymakers have done has been extremely bullish for risk assets, meaning they've propped up valuations and we've ended up with a stock market bubble, a sovereign bond bubble. We now have real estate eclipsing pricing that we saw back in the, the great financial or prior to the great financial crisis. But we're starting to enter a period of a great reversal, right? I mean, when you look at the last 13 years, in fact, when you look at the last 40 years, the Federal Reserve was able to backstop the market. Every time there was a wobble, they could step in. During, you know, in the last 10 years, bad news was good news, right? Every time something bad happened, every time we got a COVID spike, the stock market went up. Every time there was some sort of a crisis, we had some crisis in the treasury market, the repo market, Fed stepped in, stock market went up. And I think now we finally are having a great reversal where bad news will actually be bad news and good news will actually be good news. I think you know, the Fed finds themselves in a significant box now because they can't support the market like they did historically because now we find ourselves in an environment with tremendous price inflation, something that last time we saw this, I was literally on the floor eating Play-Doh. And it makes it very, very difficult to support financial assets when we've got to fight inflation. And you know, if you look at the latest Rasmussen poll, the, the largest issue on Americans' minds, I think it was about 75%, said inflation is the key issue that we're dealing with right now. I mean, you go to the pump, you get beat up. You go to the grocery store, you get beat up. High prices of cars, homes, we're seeing it across the board. And I think now that we've entered into 2022, the new paradigm is that Line item on the household P&L, interest expense, that's starting to ramp up. We didn't see that last year. We didn't see that year before, but now this year we're seeing a dramatic pickup in interest. So there's a lot of pressure. And because it's a political issue, I think the Fed can't afford to support asset prices. I believe that the Fed is going to have to step in and create demand destruction, which if you listen to what the Federal Reserve is saying, if you listen to Dudley and former heads, 
what they tell you now is that pushing stock prices down, decreasing valuations is actually a Fed policy. Patrick, it is a Fed policy. Whereas throughout my entire life, it's always been a Fed policy to increase valuations. This is the first time that in my working career where I've actually have a Fed that steps up and says, it is our policy to push the market down. And they're going to do that because the extreme majority of Americans do not own financial assets. These people get up every morning, they work their ass off, they're getting kicked to shit out of at the grocery store and at the pump. It's become a serious political issue. And I think that the Fed is going to have to really push down, mm -hmm. which as we know, if you watch Supernova last year, you can understand what has taken place recently and how that can potentially impact asset prices. Before we get started, um, we're going to talk a lot about interest rates today. We're going to talk a lot about the bond market and the stock market. And I tend to think about interest rates or interest a little bit differently than I think a lot of people do. Patrick, if I asked you, you know, what's interest? I think of interest rates as the simplest form, cost to borrow someone else's money. I think in the simplest form it is. But if you think back, if you go back through the millennia when there was a time when markets tended to actually regulate interest. Markets set interest rates. We don't live in that environment anymore. You know, largely central banks are, are, create, are setting interest rates. But if you look back over the millennia, you know, interest rates are, are really a ratio of time preference. You know, all humans prefer consumption in the present. You want a Tesla? You want it now. You don't want to wait 10 years for it. You want to take that trip to Patagonia? You want to do it now, not when you're 89. So, there's a lot of time preference. And when you look across societies, across histories, wealthier countries tend to have lower interest rates. They tend to have their daily needs taken care of and can push capital aside and invest it in the future. Less wealthy economies tend to have higher interest rates because there's more time preference. What we've seen almost exclusively over the last 15 years is central banks repressing and suppressing interest rates to below the natural rate. And it has caused a lot of really weird things to happen, right? This is the first time in history over the last decade that we've actually seen negative nominal and real interest rates on sovereign debt. I mean, if you think about it, we had $17.5 trillion in bonds yielding a negative interest rate, meaning if you invest in it, you are guaranteed to lose money. So we've effectively, by manipulating these interest rates, we've pulled consumption and we've pulled financial returns into the present from the future to the present. So as we go through here, this is the framework that we're going to be looking at. And, you know, we're going to start, I think, with the first slide that we're going to look at today is the S&P 500. And before I tap into the S&P 500, I just wanted to say one thing, you know, throughout my 20 some odd years of doing what I do, I've been involved in a variety of different roll ups in different industries. Today, we're going to focus largely on macro events and we're going to tie it specifically to the pest control industry because I believe that the extreme majority of the asset price inflation we see in pest control, these consolidation booms, Renekill, buying Terminex, these take place because of what's going on in the macro financial environment, not on the industry level. And if I go back to 2000, I remember the year 2000, you couldn't sell a government contractor for four times EBITDA. Fast forward to 2003, 2004. These things were selling at nosebleed multiples, not because of the macro environment necessarily, but because the Iraq war, 9-11, the amount of spending that took place. And we, we can look at bubbles. We can look at IT staffing, those bubbles back in the 90s. There's been a variety of consolidation booms. But the overarching theory, the overarching ingredients for this is we need a, an accommodative macro policy. So on this slide, from 2012 to 2022, we can see the breathtaking multiple expansion in the S&P 500. Now, the S&P 500, of course, is an important benchmark index in the United States. We've talked about it extensively on Supernova. It is, this chart is not a log chart. This is a standard chart. But what you can see here, and what I want you to take a look at, is you can look at the lines on this chart. Those bands are the price to sales ratios over time. So. If I really look at the kickoff to this thing being around 2012, after the great financial crisis when quantitative easing was in full force, 
we can see multiple expansion in the S&P 500. So while we hear a lot in the pest control echo chamber, you know, in pest control, we hear about it's a great industry. It's fantastic. It's the best industry on the planet. We're so happy. We're so fortunate. It is a great industry. But I think we'd be saying a lot of the same things if we were in the healthcare services or the food services space. So we can make those arguments about any industry. We're seeing the same and in certain industries, substantially higher asset price inflation than in pest control. And you know, this particular chart gives you an idea of the top, you know, 500 large cap tech or large cap firms in the United States that used to trade at 1.1 times revenue and now eclipsed in late 2021, 3.1 times revenue. So that shows you. And the higher the price on an asset, the lower the implied forward returns, right? Just, you think about it, you buy an apartment, the, high, the more money you pay for that apartment, the lower the return you're going to get on that rent, if all else being equal, if that fixed stream of cash flow is the same. The same thing for the stock market. So the stock market has repriced over the decade. Now, I think a more fair chart to look at, and I want you guys to look at this because a lot of you don't pay attention to historical norms. And we can go back over 100 years, but I, I think if we look back over the last 30 years, which captures the great financial crisis, it it captures the dot-com boom, it captures the tequila crisis, the Russian ruble crisis in the late 90s, it captures um, the bond rut of 1994. We've got a lot on this chart, but if we go back to 1992 on an equal weighted basis, which means that every all 500 companies, it's, it's basically each 500 company is represented equally, it's not market cap weighted, on this chart, the median revenue multiple, even including where we are today, is 0.9 times revenue, right? So the largest companies in the United States, Rollins is in that index, uh, Google's in that index, Microsoft, a lot of big financial institutions, a lot of big industrial companies are in that e index. So over the last 30 years, it traded roughly at one times revenue. So that gives you a historical perspective of how far this whole thing is run. Now, we all looked at Rollins back in Supernova, and we spiffed up and updated our charts, but this is one that might be familiar to some of you. Rollins is the bellwether in the industry. And we went back 30 years, we could have gone back 50. Um, Rollins spent the majority of his existence trading at between 0 0.6 and 2.5 times revenue. Now, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of technological advancement in the pest control industry over the last 40 or 50 years, if we're all honest with ourselves. Sure, we had a lot more baseboard jockeys back in the day, and we're doing IPM now, and everyone's blowing a lot of smoke. But at the end of the day, the industry hasn't changed a whole lot, right? We've seen other players get into the space. We've seen the M&A market get a little bit more competitive. But if we push all that aside and just only look at the equity markets, only look at Rollins, we see that this is a business that spent literally half a century trading somewhere around dollar for dollar. And now, as of November, in November of 2021, it was almost at nine times revenue. Nine times revenue. It is spectacular for a pest control company to be trading at 25, 30, 40 times EBITDA. And so, if you look at that shaded part of the chart, that's the era of financial repression. That's the era of central banks forcing interest rates into the floor, converting treasury bonds into base money, and making investors extremely uncomfortable with 1% yields on treasuries and looking into other markets. And so when you think about Rollins, Rollins in my mind trades like a bond. I've always viewed Rollins and the way Rollins has reacted the interest rate environment that we have been in over the last 10 years is quite a bit different than other companies that are in, in service industries similar to Rollins. And I think there's a variety of reasons for that. I think that, you know, Rollins has a very narrow public float. You know, the Rollins family and trusts own the simple majority of that business. So it's not extremely actively traded as much as other companies would be. Um, it's been a steady performer quarter over quarter. Every year this business kicks out a dividend. It is not in a technologically disruptive industry. It's got high visibility on cash flow. It's capital light. In a lot of ways, this trades like a bond in my mind. And if you look at this chart, you're going to see the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield back over the last 30 years. 
and we see Rollins, and I'm using um, enterprise value to revenue or price to sales as a proxy for us today because I wanted to remove some of the quarter by quarter variance that we see in earnings. So I'm not using PE, I'm not using EBITDA, I'm not using EBITDA, I'm just using enterprise value to revenue. And so if you take a look at this chart, you've got a 40 year trend line down and to the right. That's where prevailing 10 year yields, or prevailing 10 year interest rates have gone in the United States. We've been in a 40 plus year bull market in fixed income or bonds. If you look at the far right, you'll see that red shaded area, that's 2022. And so finally in 2022, with the Fed having only hiked interest rates once, 25 basis points, we now have broken the 30 plus year trend line in 10 year treasury yields. The other thing that you can notice, and we did talk about this in Supernova, is th there is some direct correlation in my mind as to the yield on the 10 year and how Rollins trades, right? As the yield continues to fall, Rollins trades at a higher and higher multiple. Now, there are other things going on behind the scenes there. We'll get into that. But for now, in very simple terms, Rollins trades inversely to the yield. And again, we've had 40 years of declining yields, and we finally are in a position where the market has priced in, the Fed Fund's future market has priced in at least 10 hikes this year alone. So we're getting ready for the great reversal. I'm not going to dwell very much on quantitative easing. We talked a lot about it on Supernova. If you've heard us on the buzz, we talk a lot about financial repression, quantitative easing, what it is, how it works. In fact, if you're on our distribution list next week, you'll get, I think we got a 25 or 30 page commentary that literally goes into the details of what quantitative easing is and how it specifically impacts the public equities in this space. But the only thing to look at in this chart is we've got a we've got a 20 year history here, the Federal Reserve balance sheet. And it wasn't really until 2008 where they started to increase the balance sheet, right? They started to build up the balance sheet, buy treasuries, buy mortgage backed securities and convert that into base money. And of course, the COVID crisis continued to substantially increase that um, in 2020 and 2021. So now we've got a massive balance sheet that the Fed today, this afternoon, will be talking about how they're gonna unwind that. Wow. I introduce into the concept of Rollins' EV over revenue chart, another one of our friends in the industry, rent -a kill So rent -a kill as you can see, trades at a discount to Rollins and has attempted for a long time now to narrow the gap, as has Terminix. If you look at the chart, you're seeing a couple of different things. You're seeing run a kill in orange, you're seeing Rollins in blue, and what's behind that, instead of having that pink area that I had in the other chart, I've replaced that with negative yielding bonds. So, congratulations, you are the negative yield generation. You have now seen with your own eyes over 17 trillion in negative yielding sovereign debt. And you can, I hate to draw direct causality because there, this is a system and there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes here, but the results, again, of forcing interest rates through the floor, both nominally and in real terms, causes dramatic run-ups in assets, specifically for assets that are extremely rate sensitive, like Rollins. Now, for me, the most important thing on this chart is not Rollins and Renekill, it's actually the far right side of the negative yielding bonds page. If you can, or on the right side, you can see how over the last 90 to 120 days, we've gone from over 17 trillion in negative yielding bonds to about 2.5 trillion today. I mean, like that, we saw the most dramatic repricing of the bond market in, I think in US history, I wasn't able to find a quicker repricing of a bond market that is still in process today. And after we talk a little bit about more about valuations, we're gonna get into bond yields and we're gonna get into um, the repricing of both the equity as well as the fixed income market. But for now, here's the fun stuff. 
and we're gonna see this chart more than once, but this is the good stuff. This is what all of you guys care about. You're like, I don't give two shits about Rollins. At the end of the day, what I care about is private market multiples. Now, I will tell you, all you have to do is look at this chart to realize that there is a direct impact from the public equity markets to the private market. When I go to Stockholm and I sit in EQT's office, the owner of anti cmex and I sit at the table and I look at their valuation model, what do I look at? I see Rollins trading statistics, I see Renekill's trading statistics, and I see anti cmex imputing an exit multiple for their business based upon where Renekill, Rollins, on occasion Ecolab, and I have yet to see Terminex in that mix, um, but largely Renekill and Rollins really drive that EQT slash anti cmex model. So it's extremely important. When you deal with private equity firms, when I used to make private equity firm models and go out and acquire businesses for the largest publicly traded private equity firm in the world at the time, we were doing internal rates of return analyses and a variety of different things, but I really didn't care a whole lot about interest rates. That's not what I was focused on. What I was really focused on is what are my exit multiples? Because that's how I'm gonna impute my return. And where do I get my exit multiples? I don't pull them out of my ass. I go to the, pro the public equity markets to determine what those are. So every acquirer out there is benchmarking from an equity perspective to Rollins. Rollins underpins that complex. The private equity firms, companies like anti cmbex are looking at Rollins because this is what they aspire to. And if they increase cash flow, they increase growth rates, if they look more like Rollins, they get the Rollins multiple, that's how exit multiples are determined. Now, this chart's a little bit different than what we had on Supernova. Instead of using kind of a, I don't know, I forgot the word for it, you know, that big, nasty, ugly looking block that we put on there before Patrick, we've put the upper bound of private market transactions. And we've gone back 20 years, and I'm not gonna rehash all of Supernova, but, and if you wanna look at that, you'll, we went individual transaction by transaction and gave you some color on it, but suffice it to say for half of the last 20 years, these were dollar for dollar deals. And if you've been in the industry long enough, that's what you heard. In fact, there's a lot of guys out there that still think dollar for dollar, sleeping under the rock. But either way, it wasn't until around 2011 and 2012 that we really saw this dramatic uptick in transaction multiples. And I draw your attention to that little spike on the almost marker looking line in, um, in 2021. So in 2021, we did Supernova. And Patrick, I didn't answer your question. You said, what's changed since Supernova? Mm -hmm. So Supernova was easy. We have a extremely accommodative fiscal monetary policy in the United States. Going into 2019, things started to get tight and the market started to roll over. I said, hey, this might be the top. It was 2018, 2019, I saw Rollins roll over. You can see that on there in 2018, started to roll over. I'm like, hey, things might cool off. Well, guess what? We've got a repo market issue. We've got a US Treasury issue. The Fed steps in, more quantitative easing, market sp spikes again. Now we get to COVID and in the COVID era, you know, we just saw what the Federal Reserve Bank did with its balance sheet, but just created a phenomenal amount of fiscal and monetary stimulus that jacked things up. And look, as we all know, like every one of you sitting here knows that 2020 and particularly 2021, around the time we did Supernova, had all of the hallmarks of a speculative frenzy, right? We had AMC, we had Bitcoin. My guy, my, I use a... <laughs> I use a Terminex franchise here in Puerto Rico. I have the best technician, I love the guy. He used to work in New Jersey, he's Puerto Rican, he comes to my house. And in 2021, he was demonstrating to me how I could become very wealthy, trading cryptocurrency and buying call equity options on the S&P and on the NASDAQ in 2021. So we had all of the hallmarks, right? Everyone's getting rich with Bitcoin, all this sort of jazz. The equity markets were on a tear and so, in addition to the public equity markets, SPACs, all the frenzied activity, in the private pest control market, it was around the time that we did Supernova where I said, you know what? We could literally sell anything. I mean, I could literally take a deli and put pest control company on it and somebody would come in and buy this thing. And if you look at the spike on the chart, you'll see it was in the second half of 2021 
that things really started to ramp up. And, you know, Dylan, I'm wondering if you've got a clip from Supernova, if we can play a quick clip of what we talked about uh, for 2021. The problem that we have right now is the Federal Reserve is buying treasuries, effectively converting that into to non-interest bearing base money. And we're monetizing the debt and we're starting to see the inflation uh, in the market today. And um, I think that that will have dramatic impact on risk assets going forward. But the first most important thing for you to know from this presentation is I think we are at the highest point we have been from a um, valuation perspective in pest control. I think that it will continue to ramp up this year. I think all of the government fiscal spending and monetary policy is extremely bullish for risk assets. But I think we're coming towards the end here. Um, and we're coming to very, very risky times um, based on what we're seeing. That's what we said in June of 2021. And we were watching it in real time. And I think if you talk to any acquirer out there, just like, holy shit, like things really went crazy. And we did Supernova and wanted everyone to know exactly where we were. And, you know, it's almost impossible to actually time markets, but one thing that you can do is you can realize if you try to take a logical and unemotional approach to things, you can realize when you're in the center of a speculative frenzy or bubble, it's a bubble and that's what we did. If you fast forward a little bit to August, by the time August came around, for the first time in my 20 years now almost in the pest control industry, for the first time ever, I sent out an email that I, we call the sell now email in August of 2021 and I sent it to our clients. And I focused on our clients that were the ones that were kind of on the fence trying to determine what they wanted to do. And I literally said sell now. Because August in my mind was the absolute epicenter of this frenzied storm last year. And from June, to December slash January 2022, as you can see on the chart there, private pest control transactions priced at the highest they'd ever priced at any point in history, both in the United States and in certain international jurisdictions. Now, the stock market peaked. The NASDAQ and the S&P 500 and the Dow peaked in November of 2021. And that's where some things really started to get interesting. But before we talk about peaking and the impact on, on pest control multiples, we're gonna stick with asset prices in general. And we're gonna come back to that slide because I'm gonna have some things to say about where we are in 2022 and what I think is going on today in the market. This is the case Schiller National and top 10 metro areas. I mean, it just demonstrates, you can look back from 1987 to present. I mean, the chart says a million words, right? Where you see the housing bubble and then you see the home price appreciation. And you see the home price appreciation that took place in 2020, 2021, uh, and now in 2022. But on a race, rate of change basis, that is starting to roll over. What that chart showed you is it showed you the most spectacular and rapid increase in mortgage rates that I had ever been able, I couldn't find, I looked in the history books, Patrick, I couldn't find, like, so from, from the end of last year until present, mortgage rates, long-term 30-year fix went from literally around 2.93% to 5.5% or 5.4%. And it put us in a position where home affordability from 2021, so November 2021, if you, in November 2021, if you could afford a $400,000 home, Patrick, right now today, you can only afford a $300,000 home. So it impacted the affordability of housing by 25%. And I, you know, people look at that and they think about it. And you got to remember, you and I had this discussion this morning, you know, monetary fiscal policy, all of these things take anywhere between six and 24 months and sometimes longer to actually impact the economy. I always think about it like when when we did the fiscal spend in 2020 and 2021, I almost look at it as like a boa constrictor eating a pig, right? It's in there, but it takes a while to work through the system, but it's gonna come out. And the way that the federal government handles this is they try to react to it and they react to it, you know, they're always looking through the rearview mirror. They're always overshooting things, right? Like they've overcooked this thing. They've done a tremendous amount of fiscal spend force interest rates through the floor, and now all of a sudden the Fed wakes up and says, we've got to slam on the brakes. It's almost like when I go to a hotel with my wife, it's a little chilly. 
And instead of turning it from 68 degrees to 70, she strolls in and cranks it up to 90. And for a while, you feel okay. And you lay down, and you go to sleep, and then you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you're sweating to death because she overcooked it. She cranked it up. And so that's exactly how these central banks deal with it. Like you saw that in the housing boom and bust. You saw that in the tech boom and bust. It's cranking things down and cranking things up. So this chart here, we are back to the 10-year, our favorite 10-year treasury yield. And I've got Fed funds rate. One of the things that I find interesting on this chart is we've got the Fed's fund rate is currently at the upper bound of about 50 basis points. We've done one hike in recent months. The, if you look at the yield, just the talk and jawboning of financial tightening has caused the 10-year Treasury yield now to eclipse 3%, right? So we breach 3%. And the Fed says that they're going to do many more of these. In fact, the Fed fund future market, as of yesterday, was pricing in 10.13 more hikes. So we've got a rapidly moving freight train. We've got super low but increasing interest rates. We've got a ton of financial stimulus that was done. This train's moving along. And now we've got this high inflation and all of a sudden they're gonna hit the brakes. And as I said earlier in the discussion, it is now a policy of the Federal Reserve Bank to lower stock prices for the first time in my career. And what does this mean? Well, we've got a, we've got a bubble in everything, right? I mean, think about it, guys. Go look at house prices. Look at stock market prices. People sell their businesses and say, I don't even know where to put my money because everything's overpriced. I love this chart on the screen because this shows us the, that we are off to the worst start of the year ever in the global bond market. Um, if you go back to 1990, we can chart out the returns every year to the global bond market. So this is $65 trillion in global bonds. Um, it's the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Total Return Index. That dark black line down there is welcome to 2022. In the first four months of the year, you know, I think that needs to be updated now. I think it's off almost 12% thus far this year because as interest rates, prevailing interest rates increases, the Fed can't control the long end of the curve unless they do yield curve control, but that moves. As interest rates have spiked dramatically over the last four or five months, Bond markets have sold off. They're entirely repricing now. Now we have more and more positive yielding bonds because bonds are getting cheaper. Now, that also has impacted the public equity markets. Interestingly, you know, you hear about the 60-40 portfolio and a lot of financial advisors, you know, I myself use banks like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and I talk to a lot of different portfolio managers and I still hear a lot about the 60-40 portfolio. In fact, I've heard folks in the pest control industry, financial advisors talking about the 60-40 portfolio. And what the hell does that mean? That means a portfolio of roughly 60% bonds, 40% equities. Um, I've been particularly concerned about the 60-40 portfolio now for a couple of years, especially when I saw stocks and bonds falling in tandem during the COVID crisis, which was extremely rare. And I mentioned it actually on the PCT, you know, do that PCT M&A summit. I actually mentioned it a few years ago when we got on there. But I, I felt like there would come a time when stocks and bonds fall in tandem. The purpose of the 60-40 portfolio is using when stocks fall, bonds go up. When bonds fall, stocks go up. You have a levered bond portfolio and that kind of risk parity balances out your risk. Since November, We've lost 24% on the NASDAQ, 15% on the S&P 500, and 12% on the bond fund. There's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Every trade is falling. I mean, all, everything's falling, right? I mean, we're in a position right now where the Fed is basically trying to stop this freight train, and they're going to use everything at their disposal to do it. And this is the havoc it's wreaking on the market, because the market hasn't had to worry about this for 13 years, and now all of a sudden it matters. Here's a mortgage chart. And so this is a little bit slightly different than what I was gonna show you guys before, but you can kind of see it. So look at the orange line. That's the 30-year mortgage index. That's over the last few months. You see that spike on the right in orange? That's mortgage rates. That's how, why prices are, that's why homes are 25% less affordable than they were just four or five months ago. If you look at the blue line, you'll see that negative yielding bonds decrease simultaneously at the spike in interest rates. There's no 
direct correlation between mortgage rates and negative yielding bonds. It's all a system that plays together, but yields up. These sorts of uh, fixed income assets clearly down. And by the way, this chart here only just ties in, this magnifies the last, this is year to date. So the extreme majority of the carnage, you know, we see the interest rates on the, on the 30 year mortgage going up, you know, 2% or 200 basis points uh, just this year alone. And the sovereign yielding debt or negative yielding debt went from, you know, 11.5 million at the beginning of this year now to, you know, two and change. Seismic, seismic moves this year. Now, as we talked before, we've got some inflation. And the, the reason why I want to start to tie some of these macro things together for you is that pest control owners are a very optimistic bunch. And it has served many of you very well. I've got one of the most optimistic of pest control owners on the planet, Mr. James McHale, here today, um, who will certainly delight us and entertain us. But you know, guys like him, they're entrepreneurs, they're going to run through walls, we're going to get it done. And Jim's a young dude, and he's not been at this. I mean, Jim certainly wasn't operating in a high inflation environment. And so we are all in a very different environment right now. And I, every single day when I have conversations with pest control operators, they say, Paul, I just need six more months, or I just need 12 more months, because we are going, things are going gangbusters, Demand's never been higher. I'm just having a hard time finding people. But if this keeps going, you know, I'll have a business that's 50% bigger just in two years. Will multiples hold up? And for me, this discussion is about asset prices, but it's also about kind of the real economy, right? So we talked about the inflationary pressures that the Fed's going to have to focus on. We need to think about where a lot of this inflationary pressure came from and why I believe there's going to be a big fiscal drag or gap in growth. And why I think you're seeing all these Q2 earning downside surprises. I mean, periods are uncomp. I mean, you can't comp Q2 this year to Q2 last year just because we had the COVID bounce, we had all this fiscal spend. But I think that this is going to cause a tremendous amount of drag. If you look at the PCE, the personal consumption expenditures, consumers' contribution to GDP, you see in 2021, it was spectacular. And you see that green line on the end. And if we get to this next chart, this shows you a little bit more of the types of things that I look at when I'm trying to manage my own portfolio. This is the U.S. government's social spending outlays, right? So the government has spent a ton of money, fiscal spending. We all know that tons of people one point, what, nine trillion and $1,400 checks went out the door, PPP loans, all these sorts of things. And we can see it in the numbers there. If you look at 2020 and 2021, with the 2020, the Q1 of 2021 says 1.7 trillion. Here is what we're experiencing right now, today, in Q2 of 2022. We have just crossed over the threshold from that blue line there to the first red line. That's the fiscal gap. We've, we've hit one year. We just crossed over at the beginning of April. We just crossed over the one year mark. And that stuff is going to start to cycle through the economy. And there's a $1.7 trillion hole. And it's an important hole because we're effectively in a high inflation environment the economy is beginning to actually roll over, and decelerate. And we're moving into the beginning of a Fed tightening type cycle. When you look at those fiscal gaps, you look at what was spent last year, where did it come from? You know, where did it end up going? If I look at the last five years of inflation and I break it down, I like to really understand what, you know, what are the components of inflation. And it's pretty clear to see that during COVID, a lot of the folks that work in factories were at home. You, know, you had healthcare workers and essential folks, and pest control people out and doing their job. But for the most part, factory workers had a hard, tough time. So we were making stuff. Supply chains, right? We, we, we weren't able to shift stuff. And then consumer preferences shifted from services. They shifted away from hospitality to goods. And this is exactly what happens. You see the blue lines there in the chart, the blue, the blue columns. That's price inflation in goods. So again, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the change in behavior, the government sending out these checks, and now we have inflation in goods. Of course, energy has ramped up last year or the year before it was just 
disinflationary, now it's inflationary. So here we have it. I, I did a little bit of research as I was thinking about fiscal gaps because I'm trying to think about how I'm going to position my portfolio. And so last year, as the, as the indices began to roll over, I needed to get positioned for 2022. And we talked a lot about this on the Buzz, Patrick. I've been net short in the market since December. I have been a seller of equities in the market since December. And one of the things I did when I was doing some research is I got on the Congressional Budget Office and I looked and I see that fiscal gap right there. You've got 2021 to 2022, you see it in the red box. That of course is US fiscal spending. We've got a $1.3 trillion hole equivalent to 6% of GDP. And when you start to get those sorts of holes, what ends up happening is growth accelerates, GDP turns over. If we look at the ISM services index, we are starting to decelerate. So this is, again, we haven't started the hiking cycle yet and we're decelerating there. The ISM manufacturing index is losing steam. We are now at the lowest point we've been since May of 2020. We all know where consumer confidence is. So I'm saying all these things because I think it's important to not take historical fact, just like they say, you know, financial advisors always say, you know, past performance doesn't guarantee future performance. What's gone on in 21 and 20 and 19 does not mean it's going to continue to go on going forward. And I'm putting my money where my mouth is and I'm betting that it won't. I am betting that the Federal Reserve, at least in the near term, will dramatically impact not only asset prices, but also the greater economy. And again, We've already got a quarter over quarter negative GDP print, right? We're barely out of this COVID thing. We've spent trillions of dollars and we're already printing negative GDP, right? Um, now, why are we boxed in? I have a lot, you know, there's a lot of discussions about, well, you know, the Fed could pull the Volcker playbook and jack up interest rates to 18% and control the M1 money supply and do all the things that the monetarists did back in the 1970s and 1980s. I think. The big problem with that is, you know, back in the 1970s, the U.S. was a manufacturing superpower. It was roughly a third of the global economy. It was debt to GDP at 35 percent. Um, I mean, hell, even during the great financial crisis, debt to GDP was at 60. Now, you know, we eclipsed 130 percent last year and we're at 125 now. There's not a lot of room to maneuver when every 100 basis points in interest rate increases costs the U.S. federal government about $350 billion in interest expense. So. I am betting on some rate increases in the near term. I'm thinking ultimately that the U.S. will have to capitulate. And if they do capitulate, we probably at some point, is this six months off? Is this two years off? Is it five years off? But where I will ultimately end up putting my money is the U.S. will do what Japan is doing right now today, which is yield curve control. They are trying to control the longer end of their bond curve. And just recently they went out and said, we are going to buy an unlimited amount of JGB 10-year bonds. We're going to print an endless amount of money to buy these bonds because we want to keep the yields at or below 25 basis points. And that, my friends, is exactly what happens. That's the currency. That's the Japanese yen versus the dollar. It's lost 12 to 13 percent in a matter of a few months, which is a seismic generational shift for Japan. Japan's an importer of most things. It is going to have a dramatic impact on their cost of living over there. But that is the price of yield curve control because you can either control the currency or you can control interest rates. You can't do both. So Patrick, before we get deeper into some pest control stuff, what's uh, what's on your mind over here? Man, well, I've got a few questions. Mm -hmm. Know how to operate a business. It's made a lot of rich rednecks, mm -hmm. pest control industry. Right? Yep. Gotta love it. But as I put on the investor mindset and I think timed it well in, in 2021 mm -hmm. with me and Bobby, figuring that out now, gotta figure out like, okay, what do I do with my money? And so. I'm wondering, those that are watching right now, is it better the devil they know than the devil they don't know? So if, if they were to sell the pest control business, is there a place for them to put their money? Yeah, I mean, I guess you're saying you're in the process right now of trying to determine where you want to put your cash. I guess, you know, when I always think about, you know, and I'm going to go, I'm going to move us a little bit forward here to a chart I want to bring up, Patrick, that I, I love. We're going to go back to Japan. Um, when I think about market cycles, I think about where we are right now, not only in global equities, but also in pest control. And I think about the fact that 
a lot of folks take the buy and hold approach, which is a great approach to take, right? Yeah. And But it's great if you're buying at the front end of a cycle where prices are low. It's great if you've got a 20 to 50 year time horizon. It's not good if you went out in 1990 and said, you know what, I wanna buy the Nikkei. Like I'm gonna buy the Japanese Nikkei. And it peaked in 1989. And if you waited until it sold off 25%, effectively what the NASDAQ has now done since its peak in November, and you bought it in 1990, you would still be underwater today. From 1990 to present, you would still, in real terms, not have recouped your losses. In 1929, had you bought the market index in 1929, bought the Dow, you would have been underwater until around 1954 in real terms. If you bought companies like Microsoft, parts of the NASDAQ in 2000, it would have taken you 30 years to get up. So, Mark, I mean, the wealthiest investors in the world over history have really managed the market cycle. I mean, if you think about Bernard Baruch, I read a, a biography of him over the Christmas holiday. It was fascinating because he, he was originally called the lone wolf of Wall Street in the 1920s. He was an advisor of President Roosevelt and a handful of presidents. Hmm. He was one of the most wealthy Americans and he made a tremendous amount of money in the run up to the, the great crash in 1929. Okay. But he sold out in 20, 1927 and 1928 and they were interviewing him some years later and they said, you know, what really has been the secret to your su success? And he said, I've always sold too early. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess my message to pest control operators is there's clearly the devil that you know and the devil that you don't know. I'm not suggesting that you run out and sell your business. You know, some of you guys should never sell your business. You're emotionally attached to it. It's part of who you are. The heart wants what the heart works, wants. That's it. Keep it. If you're a sophisticated investor, you really need to look at this sort of data and really think about where we are in the market cycle. Because, folks, there's lags and there's delays. And one of the good things is, is we haven't, we haven't really seen the deterioration. If I go back to this chart here, we've... We saw market multiples on the private side, Patrick, spike in 2021. Yeah, we saw a straight line, so to speak, and a spike, and it kind of came back um, to trend. Yeah. It hasn't rolled over. The market's buoyant. I will tell everyone listening to this, my opinion is in the minority. Like, if you listen to um, most pest control operators think that the stock market will continue to go up this year, they believe that pest control multiples will at bare minimum not decline because they've been up so long and this is the new normal. Even acquirers, when you talk to some of the sophisticated acquirers, they will tell you things like pest control companies always have to make acquisitions, right? Well, I mean, I don't know why it's any different now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. And, you know, you'll hear companies like AX, you know, we've got big plans. We want to get to a billion dollars in private equity firms and so on and so forth. But I mean, hell, that was Terminex's plan, and Terminex is going to be gone now in a few months, so they're not there to buy any, anything. So I just, for me, history tells me to look at the macro environment and let that govern it. The micro environment's a small aspect of it. I, I'm really focusing my attention on huge prevailing interest rate moves in equity markets, and I'm not saying the floor's falling out tomorrow. I'm just saying, like, when I think about risk versus uncertainty, if risk, I, I can... I can quantify, I can, I can put odds to risk. I know what the risk of a roulette wheel spin is, right? But when I start getting into like nighty and uncertainty, I can't ascribe a certain, I can't ascribe a risk to it. Like I, it's almost like saying, what's the chance of Italy pulling out of the Euro? Well, if I say 10%, like I would have to act as though I believe that and make investment decisions based on me believing that, but I can't believe it because it's uncertain. So we live in an uncertain period, but I think it's pretty easy for folks to look back over history and look at the yield curve and conversions, look at Fed tightenings, start to show me, go back 50, go back 100 years, and look when we have inflationary regimes and we have Fed tightening and show me indications where stock markets don't sell off 25 to 80 or 90 percent around the world. So, as far as putting your money somewhere, Patrick, having the optionality of cash, I mean, look, a pest control business is illiquid. It takes you three to six months to sell it. You can't walk out. You know this. I mean, when did you start? In March? And when did we get done with it? In August? August, yeah. Yeah, so you've got a very, very, very liquid asset. I, I don't want to be in, I mean, even stocks, even actually publicly traded stocks in a market panic are extremely liquid, and I don't even want to own them. That's why I use asymmetrical bets like options. 
But to own a privately held business, when the jig's up, the jig's up. So I think just having the op, you know, the optionality of cash to buy things when it rolls over, I think puts you in a good stead. I told you before, after you sold that business, I said, don't rush into the market, watch what you're buying. <laughs> we're, we're super high, wait for a discount. Oh, but Paul, inflation, inflation. Well, listen, I would, la- rather, lo- I would rather 8% of my cash disintegrate than losing 50% in the NASDAQ rolling over, because that's almost a sur- sure thing, right? Yeah. So that brings me to another question, Ryan. Yeah. I've heard you say mean revert. Mm-hmm. And I question you like, are you serious? Mm-hmm. This is going to mean back to dollar to dollar? Yeah. I mean, look, if we look at this chart again, I mean, it wasn't too long ago where these things were dollar for dollar. And, and, I, and I call the mean somewhere between one and 1.5 times revenue or somewhere in the five to eight times EBITDA range. I mean, for me personally, there is zero doubt in my mind that pest control will go back to that point. I mean, just hundreds of years of financial history shows mean reversion. Things shoot above trend and they go back. They shoot above trend and they go back. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I can't imagine being in 2009 and 2010 doing what I'm doing today, anything selling for the prices that they're selling now. So again, if this Fed is even halfway successful in what they're doing, I'm not saying you're going to in 12 months force it to the mean. I'm just saying like, we're in a market right now where you are, we are guaranteed right now that multiples will go down. I don't know if they'll mean revert um, now. I think they will at some point, but it's like, they're definitely going down. I mean, they're not staying the same and they're definitely not appreciating. I mean, we are in an environment where things are beginning to roll over and we're seeing it. Now, again, there's a lag. So the good news, private market, illiquid, takes a long time to figure things out. This thing is still going. And we're seeing a lot of support in the market today, but I, I mean, I truly believe that, and I am prepared for things to change here. I see 2021 was a perfect storm, right? Really leaned on your timing and yep. saying, hey, 2021, now, Supernova, like now's the time. And behind Supernova, if you were going through Black Bear, now I see this house of cards. Is, is there one more card that's just gonna make this whole thing topple when the economy falls apart? I, you know, that's a good question. I, I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, back after the financial crisis, I was at a hedge fund event in London, and there was a guy named Cole Moshe who was speaking there. Um, he's a hedge fund manager. And he said one of the things that actually really made me, it's just, you know, you hear one thing and it kind of changes your whole outlook on investing. And he was talking and basically said, look, at the end of the day, nothing matters until the market actually cares about something. He said, you don't have to predict the future. All you have to do is like, you don't have to predict the weather. You just walk outside and determine if it's raining. In 2007, the money market, the money markets were seizing up. We had some problems in the repo markets and the S&P was making new highs. So we had the, finan- the, the financial plumbing of the system was on the fritz and the markets making new highs because the market didn't care. But once the market did care, it was 2008. So it's all about like noticing. I think for me, guys are always looking through the rearview mirror at past indices of stuff. For me, it's not saying what's going to happen three months from now, six months from now, 12 months from now. I don't know if there'll be a catalyst. The Fed's going to increase rates until something breaks. We don't know what it is. Uh, In the 90s, it was the tequila crisis and the Asian crisis. And uh, in 94, I think it was a kid or Peabody went bust. You know, we had the Lehman incident. There's going to be something that breaks, right? I don't know what that is. All I know is I don't need to really predict the future. I just need to look at what's happening right now, today in this market. And I don't think much of this stuff is priced in. And why do I think that? Because there's no way these markets could still be trading, both the debt market as well as the equity markets, with what they're going to need to do to try to get this inflation genie back in the old bottle. So, talked a lot about the macro economy, mm-hmm. but I know I want to drill in a little bit. Terminex Renekill, it's on everyone's mind. That's potentially one less acquire, maybe two less for the for the near term. Yep. I mean, what what's going on? What impact has that had, or what will it have? I wake up in the morning and I don't even think about Terminex, other than the European disposition projects that we're working on for the merger. Okay. But other than that, I, I, I wish all my friends at Terminex very, very well. I don't think about Terminex as a buyer, period. Now, Terminex actually is looking at acquisition opportunities. Okay. Terminex is a buyer in certain circumstances. 
I don't care now about the number of buyers out in the market. I am literally watching what's going on in the debt markets and I'm watching what's going on with the high yield market and the credit cycle because that's ultimately, that op- I mean, that's the you know million ton freight liner coming down the rails. This big stuff, what Terminex is doing, those impact things on the margin. But I always say, and I always say to clients, it's really what these big things that, that are going on. This is what matters. All right, we are live. Yep. I've got one more question Let's for get you. It. Yep. You kind of touched on it. European, you were named as like the advisor on the mm-hmm. deal to divest Terminex's European portfolio. Can you give me a comment? No comment, Patrick. I've been warned. No comment. And, you know, I think what we're going to do now, Patrick, is I'm going to play a clip from a friend of mine named David Clark. He was a client who sold his business in December of 2021, so just a few months ago. It's now an anti CMEX portfolio company um, in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. It was a 20 some odd million dollar firm. And um, David and Don, his wife, were down here just last month. We spent, we went out to Dorado, spent some time out there. Um, we were at my house on our way out to the country club, and uh, Dylan grabbed the camera, and, and we got a quick clip of David. So we're going to play that, and then I'll be back momentarily with uh, David and Jim. Send your questions. You know, everybody thinks, oh, well, you got to check. It's easy. You know, what's the problem? You spent your whole life doing something. Now, all of a sudden, you don't have it anymore. The legacy, my dad left. What was I going to do? I'd taken it to the next level. And how difficult was it going to be for my children to take it to the next level? I'll be 60 this year, so it's time to enjoy. I've been working really hard for a really long time. (laughs) The best advice that I got was a guy, Andy, told me, he said, look, you got to find somebody in the industry that knows all the players in the market and that can get you the highest number he can. He said, that's what you've got to do. And that's how I ended up with Paul. He ended up being the choice that I made, and I think it was a good choice, even though he does have the Mexican. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> what are some of the things you look forward to doing? Uh, traveling. Uh, I, you know, all these guys that I know that have building companies, you know, they go over to Europe for a month and do all this. I could never afford to do that. Now I can. I can go do that. And not only that, but, you know, generational money for your for your children and your grandchildren and your great grandchildren who you may never meet. You know, hopefully there'll be something for them. That's a legacy. Yeah, that's right. That is, that is a legacy. Paul's not going to make the decision for you. It's still your decision to make. He's just going to lay it out there and tell you this is what it is, and you can take it or. You can go back to work, whichever you want to do. But they got in between my numbers, so I decided it was time to go. No way I ever thought that I'd get to where I'm at. No way. Not in my wildest dreams. Sorry. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's good. But it's it's true. Never in my wildest dreams I ever thought that I'd be where I'm at. Because I was trying to get out. <laughs> but, you know, God had different plans for me, so here I am. And it, and it was a good plan. Find somebody that can help you through the process, like Paul, to help you come up with, and, you know, to be there to support you. I had, you know, my wife and my family, and, you know, I had them all there. And that's where Paul comes in, because he knows exactly what's going on. And you need somebody like that in your corner. He's been treating me great, man. We went out and had a little pizza last night. Now we're gonna go uh, enjoy the beach and a little time at the country club. And sounds like it's gonna be fun. I, I've got to learn how to do all this stuff. <laughs> we have a good industry. The pest control industry is a good industry. 
good industry to be involved in. <laughs> We're like Neapolitan out here. Like Jim didn't wear his baby blue, so you don't look like Easter. Yeah, no, exactly. I'm rocking the pink for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Takes a special man. It does. It does. I am special. Well, welcome back to the island for you, David Billingsy and Jim McCall. Your first time down to Puerto Rico. First time. Beautiful how, place. How are you enjoying it? I love it. It's, yeah? it's absolutely. I love the culture. I love the food. Uh, it's been wonderful. Mexican treating you well? <laughs> yes. You're, you're a Puerto Rican. Frank, don't show me around. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was. Oh, gotcha. All right. <laughs> so. We've got Jim and David. Now, both of these guys have been on The Buzz. I've heard many a people actually tell me that both Excuse Jim's episode as well as David's episode are Thank the you. favorite. Yes, yes. Are, the, are favorites. Some people thought really? Jim's was a favorite. Some people, I think you did I, stole. Did I get more likes than You Jim? got the halo effect from Yarl because you were on the front hey, end of Yarl. I'll, so I'll, you, I'll take all the help I can get because I need plenty of it. Mm. But I didn't know. I, I, I preempt you. I love Probably, that. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks, everybody. So Stop here's why we got these guys on Bubble Trouble. First off, I like to hang out with them. I've been talking to Jim about Puerto Rico a long time. Jim, we didn't get to golf this time around, but next time we will when Jen comes down. That's fine. All right. Absolutely. All right. You're an anti CMEX man, JP McHale. Yes, sir. David, you until recently, you were the head of the West Coast for anti CMEX, and now you have come down here and contributed to an already high level of unemployment on the island yes. by. You raised the rate today. I on. absolutely did because I am gainfully unemployed. I like it. It's been that's two good. fun months. Yeah, that's good. My wife's probably not happy about it. but And there's been a lot of changes at NTCMX lately. Like you departed. Yarrow left in February. Axelrod is gone. As of what? Yesterday was his, Alexson's last day. It was yesterday. Uh, May 2nd, May 2nd Brian uh, departed. Yeah. So a lot of changes lately. There is. But you guys are actually here on behalf of yourselves as individuals, I want to start with Jim. Jim, you know, when I think about like this Bubble Trouble event and a lot of the things that are on the minds of owners that are contemplating selling the business, selling their business, one of the main things that I hear is, I've been at this for 30 years. I really? love these people. I love this office. This is a great place to hide from my wife. I just don't, I, I want She's the money. Watching, right? I want the, of course she is. Like, <laughs> I, I want, I, he didn't say that. Other people said that. He didn't say that. In his household, she's the one that boots Jen, him out. He yeah. loves you. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you tell a guy, though, that, I mean, in some ways, you were able to have your cake and eat it too? Absolutely. So, yes. And, you know, I know. Amazon warehouse workers are paying them 22 bucks an hour down the street from you, but still you stayed at NTC. Yep, right? absolutely. So tell us about that. Why are you so, still around? So listen, I mean, this was probably the, one of the most emotional and and hard hardest things I've ever done in my life. I did this for oh, 30 years. This was my baby. This was my identity. Um, you know, we built this thing from the ground up. We didn't do any acquisitions. It was all organic growth. Um, you know, it took a lot of, you know, servant leadership and a lot of focus on the client experience to sort of differentiate ourselves from the marketplace. Um, and, you know, as you know very well, we've, we've approached that topic over 15 years, probably two or three times. And, you know, I couldn't pull the trigger because of the emotional attachment I had to the business and, and the people that I worked with. Didn't you throw up once many years ago? <laughs> we were kind of going through a process. Didn't you wake? Yeah. I don't know if you find. I don't know if you actually. It actually what kind of meeting was that? But he got close to it. <laughs> no, I was yes. Sick I was to physically, physically ill uh, yeah. before uh, I had to make a decision not to sell the company prior to yeah. selling to Anti C Max yeah. on uh, May first of uh, 2019. But I did come to a crossroad and. You know, at some point, you know, you have to say to yourself, all right, what's best for my family? Where we, this, we had the, all our eggs were in one basket. Yep. Uh, everything I owned, every asset I had was in this business. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of nieces and nephews and cousins, you know, yep. 
maybe thinking about coming into the business. We all know, you know, from first generation to second generation, it's 50% success. Second to third is, is a lot less than that. Yep. So I had to make a decision that, that was best for my family, best for my brothers. Um, so ultimately, when, we, when, when I came across uh, and met with Michael Vignet and yourself in White Plains, New York, uh, several right. years ago, um, and they talked about the decentralized business model and the fact that my brand would remain mm -hmm. and I would be uh, still running my business. And the opportunities that I was presented with to really um, implement a lot of the strategic concepts that I always wanted to do yep. um, it was very exciting to me. Uh, towards the end of the J.P. Mia Kale era, uh, we had, you know, I was trying to initiate concepts, uh, push through ideas and initiatives, and we just didn't have the people. We didn't have the infrastructure. Um, AX has presented me with that infrastructure, with the resources, a tremendous amount of technology. Um, our interim CEO, um, uh, Bill Talon, recently said at a meeting, hey, you know, we're an IT company now, too. Uh, not just a pest control company, we're a technology company. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of truth to that. And so for those of you that are out there, um, you know, it's very emotional. I get it. But at some point, you have to make a business decision, work on your business, not in your business, so to speak. And, um, you know, AX, we're not heavy handed. The integration process is, is exceptionally soft. We, 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 we slowly and surely learn what made that company successful. Mm -hmm. And we don't make heavy handed changes. We don't screw around with the brand initially. Um, and we've been confronted with all kinds of challenges. One particular um, you know, a, a acquisition we did, the, the team members were on uh, you know, production pay. Uh, you know, that's a very sensitive situation. Yep. Yep. The worst thing you can do is have the technicians leave and the clients leave when yep. you, after you buy these yep. companies with the multiples that we're paying, right? Um, so we had to be very careful and strategic about how we, you know, wove those pay scales into our into our pay pay plans. Yeah. Um, you know, different. Listen, all these companies it's a very fragmented industry, highly niched, very uh, distinct cultures. The integration part is is really where we execute best. Yeah, and, and David, now you and Jim are cut from a slightly different cloth. I'm an employee, or at least was. True. And Jim didn't come from the trailer. <laughs> no, no, listen, yeah. I mean, I grew up small beginnings in Florida and a lot of people have heard that story, mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, I grew up in a double wide trailer and me and my cousin Skeeter and you know, small <laughs> beginnings. You know, so I was just super humbled to, yep. you know, be in the position that I was in with, with anti CMX. I mean, make no bones. I mean, anti CMX changed my life. Yep. I mean, you know, it, it put my wife and I in a, in a position where, you know, we, we have the ability to make some decisions, but you know, it would have probably been very different if Matt would have sold to one of the other, you know, the uh, larger acquirers. Well, you're so rich now, you feel comfortable wearing a pink sport coat. Rich. Like, you've got to have oh, money to pull that off. Like, no. you can't do that if no, you're poor. No, this years of Brooks right. Brothers. I got yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, rich, uh, Jim's rich. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> so, but David, so you were, when you and I really got to know each other, First deal. First deal, you were at the helm of Americans. The Nixon family sold that business. You're running American Pest in the Mid-Atlantic. And that was during the era, era where I feel like you and I talked every single week because you're just killing it. One deal after another, one deal after another. Then you went out and you ran the West Coast for anti-CMX for what? Less than a year, I think. Uh, it was right over five, 14 About months-ish. Okay. Yeah. okay. But I mean, what sort of you know, what sort of changes have you seen in the industry, you know, over, or at least, again, this is not necessarily about anti CMEX, but I want to understand, like, what have you seen over the course of your career in this industry, at least from an M&A perspective? I, I mean, you know, so, uh, so Matt sold in 2016. I started at American in 2006, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, we really didn't do any m and I didn't know what m and was. Yeah. Hell, when anti CMEX came in and Michael Vignet came in and did his presentation, after he left, I looked around the room and I was like, did anybody understand half of what the hell he just showed and, us? And it wasn't the language. No, I didn't know what EBITDA was yeah. and, you know, yeah. all of these fancy things. So, you know, so obviously, probably 14-ish, we started noticing, you know, some of the consolidation mm -hmm. in the D.C. area. Connor sold to Renekill and mm -hmm. some of the businesses we traded, traded against, you know, good competition yep. began to sell, you know. So that's really when we started to see things begin to progress for us. Yep. And then obviously, you know, 2016 in September, we're sold. They give me the keys to the kingdom and, you know, and, you know, what a, I mean, I got a PhD in basically five years from anti-CMX. We yep. did 12 deals at American. I did 20 deals total before I left. And, 
Um, I mean, the market itself, though, is just the consolidation is happening. There's no doubt about that. But I just think, you know, for for some of your listeners that are on that have those, you know, smaller businesses, million, two, three million dollar businesses, you know, you've got these large players in the market and they're consolidating. So they're buying the American Pest and the J.P. McHale's of the world. And, you know, I think there's a huge opportunity for those businesses to really gain market share in those, you know, the D.C. market or New York City, New Jersey, Florida, whatever it may be, to be able to grow those businesses because, you know, customers, they want that local business. And the bottom line is, is as much as I wanted American to be the local business, Mm -hmm. we were something larger now. What about, David, on the, you know, I'm on the sell side, right? You are. You made me pay. I make you pay. You're on the buy side. I mean, would you disagree with anything that I... I said about the speculative frenzy that took place in 2021 in the pest control M&A market. I totally agree. It was nuts. I mean, it was nuts. Businesses that, you know, generally would not have commanded the multiples. I mean, they're just, it's supply and demand, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, once again, small beginnings, cousin skeeter, trailer, right? So I'm not a smart guy. It's, but uh, I mean, it's supply and demand. Mm-hmm. And uh, the really, really good companies, the McHales of the world, and, you know, those, those got snatched up and those should still continue to to demand high levels of, of multiples. But it was the other ones that, you know, you'd look at them and you'd be like, eh, you know, three or four years ago, I would have said, I'm not interested in that pass. Yep, yep. You know, then all of a sudden you guys are coming to us or we're self-sourcing deals and we're finding things and we're like, what would you smirk about that? I mean, we were working kind of. Kind of. Um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, but you, but you see these businesses and you're like, you know, I mean, I would have paid, you know, one and a half X, yep. you know, for it, you know, three or four years ago. And now all of a sudden, you know, Franco's saying, ah, Billingsley, uh, 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 four X or you don't get the deal, you know? Yep. So how was that? It's a good, good was Franco? Almost right. pretty good. All right. Yeah. It's like nails on a chalkboard. for Exactly. Sure. Exactly. Every buyer in the industry yeah. is like, Franco. Ah, ah, Billingsley's <laughs> talking again. <laughs> and Jim, since you sold to anti CMAX, you have done some deals yourself, and I think you've probably done five or six of them. Up we did five last Metro. year, correct. And so what is what is the J.P. McHale platform? The day it sold, it was 25, 26 in that area. Yep. What is it now? We've we've doubled. We've okay. doubled the, the, the revenue model. Okay. Um, you know, we did see the peak uh, multiples uh, in the back half of 21. Um, you know, right now, you know, there's still room. We're, we have an aggressive M&A um, protocol. Uh, we're looking for strategic companies in high value areas, um, you know, strategic tuck-ins, uh, quality companies that that will that we can open up new uh, geographical footprints. Uh, so, um, you know, there's definitely an M&A market, but the, I think you know we can all agree that the peak was probably you know the back half of 2021. And um, I know the market's got a little more competitive with some private equity firms, but mm-hmm. I think it's definitely leveling off. And I think uh, we're going to be much more selective in the companies that we take. Uh, and there's goods that are going to have to fit, you know, check a certain certain boxes with, in regards to tech utilization, density plays, uh, you know, new geographical footprints. Uh, You're going to go to Buffalo? Like I heard you go to Buffalo, right? If we get the right, if Buffalo, we get the right, maybe, maybe right profile, we're we gonna go to Canada. I'll we spread we some get the right, here. we get the right company and the right platform with the right people. I mean, one of the, you know, one of the most uh, positive things we get from these acquisitions is we get talent. Um, you know, we get, and if you can get the right people on board through these acquisitions, uh, you know, the sky's the limit. You know, uh, good people in this industry is, is, you know, it's a talent-starved industry, yeah. and it's great when you get people that are, uh, you know, passionate about the industry and really are open to learning and and growing. Let me ask you both. I got this is the same question for the two of you. Like we didn't prepare for this. This is basically us coming on here live. Yeah, sure. I tend to think, and I, I know that you guys are operators. You you know so much more about pest control and operations than I'll ever know. So I'm going to ask you an unfair question. But I tend to think, at some point in time, and I think that time is closer that transaction multiples will mean revert to where they were for the majority of your existence in the pest control industries. Being not finance guys focused on that, what's your initial gut reaction to that? I would agree. Yeah, I would agree. I don't know if they'll go back to historic low multiples. Um, I think the new PE players that are involved will keep, you know, prop up some of the you know, multiples for the time being, whether they stay in the market uh, and how long they stay in the market or if they flip these companies, I think that's going to be a determining factor as to how these multiples are going to play out at the end of the day. But, um, 
you know, I, I would I would say, you know, just like the stock market, like when you're when you're playing stocks, a lot of times they go on a run and then when they come back down, they, they don't hit, a, you know, they break through sort of a ceiling and yeah. then there's a new ceiling, there's a new high watermark, so to speak, or no low, low watermark, so to speak. So I think there might be a new low watermark at some point. And I think that uh, I believe that, you know, these PE players and these new entries into the marketplace are going to are, are going to, you know, shed light on, on how yeah. this thing unfolds. Yeah. And I think they're filling the void now with the whole Renekil Terminix stuff. I mean, there, there's no doubt that some of that has cooled off. They're still doing some yeah. deals here yeah. and there. So the PE firms, you know, the Thompson Streets and, you know, the Certuses of the world, they're kind of filling those gaps and holes for the time being. Um, you know, but once again, I go back to the whole, uh, if you have a quality company, high recurring revenue, you know, yeah. good profitability, good people, you know, the talent acquisition piece of this, I still think that those are going to command really high multiples, you know, but the other, you know, the businesses that are 50, 60% recurring and, yep. and probably need to be developed, you know, they, they need to be able to get that business ready to sell so they can get the full max value yep. out of that. And I think because multiples in 2021 were so high that, you know, I mean, these people that weren't ready to sell were just like, I could get what? You know, I mean, Supernova, you know, as 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 the, the you sellers. You both were on Supernova. We yeah, were, but yeah, we super were. pissed at what it did the multiple sports. <laughs> you know, that's what I was trying to do. All super clients, piss you off. They were super happy, right? <laughs> and we were like, damn, you know, what is John and we're doing? I had doubled down. Oh, man. So, you know, but I, I you know, I do think they're going to come down some. Um, the PE is going to fill some of that gap for now. And then once we're in a kill and Terminex, whenever this thing closes and, I don't know, 12, 18 months is down the road and, and they figure out what they're going to do with that business, then I think they jump in with both feet. And that's probably going to heat the market up again. Now, I have some questions for you guys, but I know you, you two are sexy beasts and you have a lot of fans out there, oh, especially yeah. amongst the ladies. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to request... My colleagues, do we have any questions? You want to bring them on over? Any questions that have come in? The question I have is, I'm so happy she's not here. Only to am I, us. Not <laughs> only, there we go. Yes. Like, thank you so much. Appreciate we'll it. This another, is good, by the way. Yeah, it's very good. That's smooth. The Mexican put a bunch of these bottles at my house. Oh, good job. Yeah, it's almost as good as happy, but yeah. I'll take a little bit more. Thank you. So, so questions. We're, we're going to get, well, they'll come out in the cards. Like, you drink first, David. That's how we operate down here. Like, no, we're not going to get down the glass. You're in the PR, yeah. baby. Yeah. And the cards are in. Perfect. All right. Yikes. We got some questions. I like it. I feel like I'm in a hot seat. Is it getting hot in here? It's getting it hot in here. Question number one. Oh, wow. There's some good questions here. Keep them coming. I like them. Question number one, is Jim McHale single? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. As a matter right. of fact, I think my wife and my sister-in-law are on this call. And, uh, I think I'm married to both of them. I, I thought that only right. happens in Italian families. It happens in Irish families. I think you are married, Allison. Yeah. Well, hi, Allison. <laughs> Sorry, okay. ladies. Jim is taken. Jim is taken. Okay. Yes. Interesting. I didn't see a Billingsley single anywhere in here. I'm looking like. Yeah. So, that's because I'm poor. What do you? Well, you got a pink coat though. And that I means a, that's a sign a of wealth. Job. That's a sign of wealth. Oh, I'm poor yeah. and don't have a job. You're like that Seinfeld episode. What is it like? Um, unemployed, live with my parents. Like the opposite, right? Yeah. That's my favorite episode. Yeah. Okay. What do you think the time horizon is for a sale? Assuming we close, assuming we choose to hold through the impending recession, would you predict it is three years, five years, ten years before we see a recovery? Like for me, like my days are like trying to predict things. Like so if I answer this question, my days of trying to predict things are entirely over. I I mean shit, like I never expected what would happen during COVID. Like all of that stuff. So it, it's just it's really impossible to say, actually. I mean, on the one hand, guys, like from a valuation perspective, I mean, there is a chance. I look at it and I say, you've got so much underinvestment due to ESG and like petroleum products and all those upstream and downstream aspects of the energy industry that like at some point, like, look, I talked to Fidelity and T. Rowe Price and all the portfolio managers. And these are the guys that own significant chunks of Renekel and Terminex and Orkin. And, you know, all of these guys are trying to deploy capital. One of the things that we have to always keep in mind is that investors' preferences change. There's different investment opportunities. There's tech, there's no tech, there's this, there's that. So it's hard to say, like, you know, I wish I could answer that question. How, how long does the recession take? I don't know. 
But does a recession actually hurt the value of pest control companies? Why wouldn't it? I mean, I, we're about as recession-proof a business we, as we can get. So yeah. as long as you get some capital, and listen, so, so, I'm but there's talking always, in waters There's always two variables, right? There's always, I, I, I understand if you're, if you're recession resilient, like there's this stream of cash flow. So let's go with it and says, you know what, David's, damn it, he's right. Not only is it easier to hire people, but like business didn't trail off. So the fundamentals of the industry are strong. That's one, that's one leg. The other leg though is the current pricing of the asset. And if the Fed really hikes and, or the bond market doesn't believe the Fed and it does it on its own, I mean, that's really the... Well, if money gets more expensive, then, then yeah, multiples that's, should have to come That's down. the problem. Yep. Um, how much does business market location affect multiples when selling? Which markets are the hottest? Now, David, you are a transnational dude. Like you were East Ooh. and what? That's right. Think about it. Like transnational. <laughs> you were trans. You're trans I'm for sure. Trans. That's great. <laughs> David's trans for sure. I got a pink sport coat on for yeah. Christ's sake. Yeah. Okay. So you're All trans. Right. So I'm trans. You live in DC. I identify as, could you please use the proper pronoun? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, what do they? What do they think? <laughs> is that what you were well, looking for? This just went in a completely different. And this is live. God help and us And this all. is Potomac. We don't have an HR department. We can do whatever we want. You know. So. So what do you? What do they think? So. So from a trans point of view, everybody. <laughs> um, you know, from a market standpoint. I mean, listen. You can get really strategic, and you know, I think you guys. And this is more you. It definitely has nothing to do with Franco because he sucks at life. So he sucks um, a lot of things. He does, yes. So, um, <laughs> but the, I think I think depending on obviously, listen, we went out to Southern California. We went out to California. Yep. I say we. Yep. Sorry, you know, yep. see still yep. still in the blood. And I bleed blue still, I guess. But yep. you know, we get out there, and there were certain markets that we wanted to get into. So, and you guys knew that. I you knew know, that. So consequently, it was going to demand a higher multiple. Yep. Um, you know, same thing. You know, I mean. Jimmy's probably got some targets up in the Long Island, New York City area, and, and some of those are going to fill a need, whether it's because of route density or, you know, maybe this team's got a great leadership team and he needs, you know, some more leadership in those areas. So I, I think markets can absolutely drive multiples. It just depends. You know, the nice thing about, and I think you guys do a good job of this, is you know which markets the acquirers are going into. Mm -hmm. So when you do get an asset like that, you know how to price it appropriately and, and get full value at it. We do. Uh, yeah, I just might add that, you know, high value locations, filling out, uh, filling white space for us, mm -hmm. that's that's a huge priority. And if you have the right kind of business with a certain amount of reoccurring revenue, certain amount of EBITDA, uh, you know, we'd be very interested in, in, in speaking to them. Um, also, verticals that are not affected by COVID. Mm -hmm. If you serve verticals that are unaffected by COVID, that's another high value play. You guys are coming up with great questions. And, you know, that's why we did not, we actually did nine supernovas last year, which was a really ridiculously dumb idea in retrospect. We, it sounded great, but that's why, like, you were in New York, like, you yep. were in, where were you? In California, was with California, Shane. California, with Shane. Right. Yeah. So, and then we brought on different people from different acquirers, and we did them by the region because every region is very different, right? Like, if you think about it, take, take a, a lot of the Midwestern markets where, you know, Rollins, for example, has focused on the Midwest acquisition, but you guys had no platform out there. So you weren't gonna buy a $3 million business in Missouri or Illinois. Um, so every market is different. And the West Coast has been different from the East Coast. Um, so that was a great answer. In today's market, what is a reasonable multiple for a sale? A 30 year history and about $1.2 million in revenue. And I will tell you, it's impossible for me to answer that question. Because a company that does $1.2 million in pure play recurring commercial that's priced above the median of the market is gonna be a lot different than $1.2 million right. with 300,000 in residential recurring, low price, and a bunch of one times. So it's really difficult to answer that sort of question. Yeah, we'd have to look at all the components, you know, some, recurring revenue, yes. but, uh, uh, route density, tech utilization, you know, what uh, service lines they have, what verticals they yeah. serve. Use it's a complex model. Order. It's portfolio, right? It's portfolio, it's portfolio yeah. portfolio business they portfolio have. That's business. recurring revenue. And if, and if, like Jim will look at the numbers. Like it, it, For David, you would want to send in a photo. Like if you have a photograph, like we do want to send that in. Okay. Yeah, uh, drawing, stick sure. figures, that's really helpful for me. I like pictures. If the valuation declines to one to one and a half times, Will it go back to three times revenue? If so, what is your best guess for when that happens? I, I, well, I, I will, I, I, you know, 
being the elder statesman of the group here, I've seen I've been, I've seen a couple of cycles, uh, you know, and uh, when I first got into the business, the waste management uh, roll up, yeah. um, you know, and then it was that another was 15, 30 20 years. years. It was ago. at 30. So 30 now, Jim, um, you're old. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm old. And uh, wow. unfortunately, and uh, so, you know, listen, I think everything's cyclical. Um, I don't think we can time it. But it, it'll come back, you know. If you're uh, if you're in the business right now and you're and you're growing it and you're tw in your twenties, I think you've got a good uh, opportunity to maybe you know take another bite in you yeah. know twenty years. If we look at, <clears throat> I mean, it, all you have to do really, if you really want to do this, is look at micro market cycles. Pull the Dow and the S and P five hundred up. You can use those as proxies for valuations because at the end of the day, that governs. All you have to do is look back. You can pull that up from 100 years. Just get online. And you'll see that these market cycles tend to range from a few years all the way up to about 30 years, with the median being kind of 10 to 15 years, these market cycles. Now, we're in the great moderation now. So the crises that we're having are more violent and dramatic, but they tend to be you know, more dispersed. So I would say it, we've had, what, a six or seven year run if they mean revert, you probably got, you know, let's call it 10 to 15 years. Now, the good news is there's a lot of you guys, there's a lot of guys out there that are, are you know, their 30s, and they got 20-year horizons. Yep. And, and they can live that out. It's the guys, the guys that I worry about are <clears throat> my clients that are the slowest in really moving things along tend to be the guys that are like 60 to 80. And they're the at-risk population for a lot of things. Yep. Heart attacks, dropping dead, and also missing the boat on this. And so... It's like those are the guys that won't get another chance if this thing rolls over. Especially in today's environment, we've, we're facing things that, that's unprecedented, right? Interdicted supply chains, uh, you know, uh, spiking fuel. Um, I mean, I guess we had spiking fuel in, in some of the cycles I've seen. 14 and 08. Yeah, that's right. so, I mean, you know, we, we get through it. This business is recession resistant. Again, uh, during the downturns, you know, the residential side always spikes. Yep. Commercial side is tempered. It's a grind. Yeah. But if, if you want that valuation, I still firmly believe, and I said this like twice already, is, is if you've got a quality business that's built right, high recurring, high profitability, good people, I still think that those are going to continue to command high valuations. You know, So if, if you're worried about missing the boat, I, I'm not so much about missing the boat. It's more make sure that you've got your business built the right way mm -hmm. for the acquirers. You know, and I think there's some really smart folks that have have done that with their businesses, and you know, um, they've they've commanded high values for those. But it's got to be built the right way. I mean, my relationship with Paul spans over 15 years. We we got together every couple of years, talked about my numbers, what we needed to do to optimize the valuation. I've I've, I've met with you know the big three um, multiple times over the course of my career, and and you know they kind of shaped. Uh, you know, how we grew the business, and, and that's very smart to benchmark and to speak yeah. with people who have the intellectual uh, property and, and, and can help you in the acumen. This industry has been very uh, good to me. Uh, people like always baseball been very, very good very, to you. That's right. Uh, people always willing to share information. Yeah. It was just a great industry and a uh, small industry, and I, I've made connections across the country. It's been fantastic. And, uh, you know, those of you that are young, 22, 25 years old, it's all out there for you. You just have to seize the moment. Absolutely. And I'll give the boardroom buzz a shameless plug here. Is, I mean, you guys, throughout this journey now, it's, what are you, a year and a half? Almost 100 episodes. You know, so you go Painfully. through those episodes. Yeah. And I mean, there's some good quality stuff in there on how to build your business the proper way. I wish, um, and I, it's yeah. all you gotta do is subscribe to the bus. Yeah, yeah. I wish, I wish this was around when I first started. You know, first came into the industry, it would have been fantastic. Well, but uh, you guys didn't even have TV back. Yeah, then, they didn't right? have face masks on no, football helmets no. when I started. So I mean, you guys used to crowd them on the radio. <laughs> but you right? had all it? those dudes at Western that really looked out for you. I did. I had, I had some great mentors: Tony Fortunato, Tony Ramirez, guys at Western. Bunch of Tonys. I kind of yeah, kind of bunch of Tonys. Tom Pedersen. Yeah. Tonys, you just yeah. you missed Tony by a month. He was down here a month ago. I know. He told me. I, I got photos. Franco sent me photos of yep. he, he and Tony on the beach. And, yep. uh, yeah. No. Frank it was kind of weird. He's a good friend, long time. It's weird. Like he's down here with his wife, but then I see the picture and it's him and Franco, the Franco. Mexican laying on the beach. I was like, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I... Um, That's not a good picture. I got more mind. questions. Franco on the beach. This is actually an interesting one. It's not really relevant to you guys. This is, do you have any comments specifically directed towards the Canadian pest control market? And, you know, Canada is 
from my perspective, I know you guys aren't in Canada. You've actually looked, Vina used to look at a few yeah, things in yeah. Canada. That's, that's a good Givlin question, though. It is a good Givlin question. Yeah. yeah. Hey. You know what we're going to do? We are going to take this question and we're going to send it to Givlin and we are going to get back to you on it. But no, the pest control market in Canada is very similar to the U.S. market. The, Canada to me, all of Canada is like the West Coast of the United States. When I look at the East Coast, it's old firms, very developed, American, J.P. McHale, like all Viking, all the old school developed firms. California is kind of the Wild West, lower recurring revenue. They're kind of focused. There's a lot of rat cities out there, right? Canada's like that. You tend to have lower recurring revenue. Obviously, the weather is adverse. Um, Huge termite market, though, right? I'm joking. Joking. I don't no remember, termites yeah, I don't there, remember I don't any yeah. termites at all. No, no. It's a little cold um, up there. No. Okay. Will the mechs be making an appearance? Oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> I, uh, I don't He's got a face know radio. about that. <laughs> Do we have any more questions yes. coming through here? All right. I mean, how many folks we have online? Because if the mech shows up, they're going to all leave immediately. Uh, all right. So questions are being brought over. We're not going to bring the mechs online. No. <laughs> it's good. It's probably got those, you know, stupid swim trunks on or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys, um, you know, that those sunglasses, his hair blowing in the breeze. Yeah. Yeah. More questions. All right. Is there a correlation between gross profit versus EBITDA revenue to a company valuation? I got some opinions, but I want to start with you guys. Is there correlation? Yeah, I mean, we, we love to look at gross margin. We, we would love to see, you know, that's one of the leading indicators to, for us to say, hey, this is, a, this is a great business. And, you know, certainly anything north of 58% on the gross margin is, is, is very attractive. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, yeah. there should be. You know, unless you're in direct cost or just out of control, right? Yep. You know, so that's going to affect EBITDA. But you want to have that higher gross margin business. It usually means that you're priced properly. It usually means that you're routed properly, so you're efficient. Um, usually means that your your wages aren't crazy high as well. Um, you know, so when you see that high gross margin business, you know, it usually points to all of those things. And then EBITDA should come through. And even if EBITDA doesn't, those indirect pieces are, are much easier to control. If you've got a wage issue, that's hard to undo. I mean, that's tough. I, I have now gone through and looked at the business cases, the internal business cases. You know, I've been doing this long enough. I can see these. Your friends at anti match actually sent me a business case inadvertently on accident. That was, you know, the ones that you guys put that together. Must have been Schmidt. I don't remember who I'm joking, sent Schmidt. it to me, but one of them did. So I've seen them all, and, and basically they're all very similar, right? You guys are looking at these business, looking historical financials, you're pro projecting them in the future, you're trying to quantify synergies, you're making your business case as to why you guys should do the deal and how you're valuing it as such. And inevitably, over time, if you take a business like Anti CMAX, being a private equity roll up, you have the platform, JP McHale or, or American, for example, right? And then if I go out, if I'm running J.P. McHale, 50 million in revenue, I find a $5 million business, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, you would first be looking at like top line revenue, understanding the quality of that revenue, looking at the gross margin, because that's the big picture there. Mm -hmm. And then you're thinking about, okay, who's staying, who's going, how can I get some back office, field of finish efficiencies. And what I've noticed lacking from almost every business case that an acquirer has done is really the field efficiency analysis. Meaning, they talk about technicians, but they really don't route it. That's like the gravy. Like we're, we're ta you know, we're taking that gravy there, but we're not, it's not going in the business case. You guys make reference to it exists, it always exists. Yep. But I mean, are there any things that, you guys being, you being the president of American over time and you being a former seller, are, are there things that you learned or anything that surprised you being part of a big company when you look at acquisitions? You probably learned a lot, I would imagine. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've learned a tremendous amount since I've joined AX, um, you know, in regards to KPIs, dashboards, mm -hmm. the transparency, the accountability. Um, but, you know, pricing, pricing's an art. Um, you know, we want to make sure people are doing regular price increases. Um, one of the big initiatives that our, Jarl, um, 
made, you know, before inflation started, was like, we need to adjust our pricing. We need to get ahead of this. Yeah. He called it the 800-pound elephant in the room, right? And uh, we had to stay ahead of the, the, the inflationary uh, headwinds. Um, so we look for, you know, regular price increases when we're, we're, at, we're at a company. Uh, yeah, tech utilization, what the routes are valued at. Um, you know, just general overall efficiency of the, of the company. Uh, you know, vehicles, you know, all the direct stuff, so. I want to ask you, Jim, you know, when we... The final time we went through, pro like when we went to real process and you met with Yarl and all these guys and we went over to Stockholm and you had Jen over in, in Stockholm, which is fantastic. Yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in the hotel that where Stockholm Syndrome was uh, invented. Exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly, where I put her. Exactly right. <laughs> yes. I, I remember that very distinctly. Um, nice bar, though. It was a fantastic bar. Paul loves Stockholm. I love it. He I, may or may not have missed a flight occasionally. For, I may have. Maybe one I've day. been there. I, I was, wouldn't know anything I about that I was looking trip. back yesterday. I'd been there like 30 times over the last four or five years with everything that was going on over there. But <laughs> I love Stockholm, actually. But when we, when you finally got serious, you had looked at transaction multiples, you looked at kind of the family dynamics, and you said, I've got all these nephews, and I gotta, I gotta get my ducks in a row, and I gotta figure this out. You looked at strategics, and you've had like, you know, between John Wilson and Orkin and Freeman, and you know all these guys, you know yeah. forever, so it was super easy conversations. Yeah. But you really wanted to explore private equity, and that was the very, very beginning of private equity looking in the yes. industry. And when we compared enterprise value between what the strategics could do and what private equity could do, I mean, there was a big enough delta where, I guess a little bit more context for the listeners, you know, Jim had two brothers in the business, and so you wanted to stay, and you were happy to roll all of your equity but we needed to make sure we got them out at a fair price. And Correct. they weren't going to be like, oh, I'll take a discount so Jimmy right. can... Right. That's why X was the perfect model, because they were strategic, yet also a private equity. Yep. Yeah, the best, yep. best of both worlds, yep. right? Yeah. I mean, do you ever think about, like, I mean, I know you're part of AX now, and we're live on the air, but uh, do you think about what it would be like? Or, or what, what, could you, what, what sort of thoughts do you have for guys that are your age now, even exploring the private equity route? I know you haven't gone through it. Do you find that as um, Yeah, I mean, after still? talking to those, to, to, to all those private equity companies, I mean, we, we, we interviewed I mean, Morgan Stanley, have a whole There's bunch of- uh, Tons of them. Yeah, yeah, tons yeah. of them, and we talked to them all. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, we didn't have the infrastructure mm -hmm. to- to uh, optimize the value for for those private equity firms, so we, you know it would have been a very risky situation for us to roll our equity in and then uh, without the infrastructure. So the fact that AX was a strategic, they they were, they were in our space already. Um, they understood the model. They they sort of said to us, "Hey, you know, once you're on board now, you know." Well, your brothers have retired. You need to build out a leadership team and build this infrastructure out." Um, you know, the, the, their guidance was very instrumental. So, I mean, guys that are talking about a private equity firm now, you, you, make sh you need to make sure you have the proper infrastructure when you merge with those so you can hit the ground running and, and get your second bite of the apple in a, um, you know, in a, in a fruitful way. So, we have a lot of interesting questions, actually. Speaking of private equity, how has PE affected the current acquisition market? How will it affect the future acquisition market? Which of the macroeconomic factors impact PE companies in the pest space? I can answer that to a certain degree. So, as I've said recently on The Buzz, if we have 20 bidders on a process, yep. 15 of them are private equity firms. And um, there's, I'm getting on a plane leaving Puerto Rico next week. I am sitting down with a client and a $6 billion private equity firm that is about to enter into the pest control space. So they're moving in. And I've talked on Supernova, there was a, a clip of me talking about how private equity always tends to enter the party late. And I can say that because we used to, I used to be at American Cap, we, we would go out and we would look for these opportunities and we would enter late because we always wanted to find something that was proven, right? We wanted to, like, we didn't want to be the pioneers. True. We wanted to go out and try to find an industry that was proven. In the world that we live in right now, this whole essential service, residential services has become, I mean, there are literally private equity firms that have started groups called the residential services group within mm -hmm. XYZ Capital to go out and buy plumbing, HVAC, all of this sort of stuff. So to answer some of the questions, has PE affected the current acquisition market? 
in the second half of 2021, there were many instances where PE was solely responsible for pushing up valuations above historical limits. I mean, it was literally private equity bidders doing this. How will it affect the future acquisition market? I think that it will, you know, private equity, when they model these things, again, like I talked about on the show, they model it based upon exit. And David, you guys, you guys actually know this. I'm not going to ask you to give away secret sauce, but when you look at anti CMX's valuation, it's a PE model. What do they do? They take Renekill, they take Rollins, they tie it right to those multiples Absolutely. and they impute enterprise value. That's how your stock, you guys roll oh, equity in listen, it, that's how it's valued. That second so, bite of the apple yeah. for me was was great. And yeah, that's, I, that's, I can, that's I can why. I see it right here. Yeah. Like you had a lot of hey, second on, apple. You, like that. Pounds, you look man, great though. You did yeah, lose some weight. Um, the, so I think it'll continue to support the market. The thing about it is, is like it's, so what macro economic factors impact PE companies? I'll tell you what, the biggest, in 2021, PE firms were putting the upwards of seven times EBITDA leverage on businesses. So think about that. Seven times EBITDA was the debt. If you look at one market, you know, and something anyone can look at is if you type into like Google ticker, T-I-C-K-E-R, H-Y-G, that's the high yield ETF. It's a very simple way to monitor the credit cycle. And as the dollar increases the way it has been as interest rates go up. It's very, very hard on the on high yield credit. And so I would say the number one impact on private equity is credit. The number two impact or where the publicly traded companies are, are, are focused. I would say that when you talk to private equity firms, and I meet with them every week, when you talk to them, most of the guys are younger than me. Most of them are in their early to mid 30s. They have never lived through like a 2008 or a 2000, 2001. None of these guys have any idea how to navigate this and they're all extremely bullish, which is good for you, the seller. Like you want them to be bullish and you should be very happy that this is an intimate discussion with our brethren in the industry. All these private equity firms were booted. We didn't let them on here. Right. There's no private equity firms on this. Straight up pest control talk today. But at the end of the day, like these guys are very bullish about this industry. and. They look and they have the ability, I think, to do some consolidation. I think that private equity firms have to commit capital. They have a ton of proverbial dry powder. Um, The one thing about private equity, and the last thing I'll say about private equity is if you think about it, how do private equity firms get paid? They get paid because it might be two and 10. It might be a 2% management fee or 1% management fee, and then they get 20% of the upside. So if you're a private equity firm and you go out and you get a massive return, you get a massive payday, but if you, have, if you bust out, you don't lose money because you're sharing in the upside. Now, you might have a hard time raising capital going forward, but we go through these cycles and financial mm-hmm. investors have short memories. So the good thing about financial private equity in late stage, I love me some private equity in late stage because these guys are always looking at the back end, is that they can't go, bu- the principals there can't lose money. They're losing their investors' money. So for me, I say double down on this, guys. Like it's time to, it's a transfer of wealth from pension funds, from everyone else that's investing in these private equity firms into your own pocket. And I say take advantage of it. And that's what I pushed last year, big time. Um, If I might add, you know, you talked about the dry powder. Um, You know, in my circles, every private equity person I speak to, not, not ones I'm doing business with, just in passing, their biggest problem right now is finding a deal. So... That's something you could leverage you know, if you're a seller. You yeah. know what I mean? They, they have a, a tremendous amount of cash, and they are looking for deals. For dry powder? They have dry powder. Look, what kind of dry powder? Paul can answer that question. <laughs> now that you are unemployed, this is a legit question. Oh, boy. Now that you are unemployed, how can you help my business, David? It's a legit question right here. Um. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I don't know. I've got, you know, 16 years of experience. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, for that, that business owner, I mean, I was talking about this earlier, you know, if, if you're interested long term in selling, you're not ready to sell now, but, you know, you want to be able to take your business from that 50%, 60% recurring. How do you, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, how do you get that? You know, I've got some experience in being able to do that. So, 
you know, I, I certainly can, uh, you know, do some of that. I, listen, I'm, I'm accepting all calls and entertaining all offers right now. Uh, I have been off for two, two months now, so it's been good. The break was, uh, was much needed. I like it. Um, but, uh, but eventually I'll get back into the game some, some way, shape, or how. Um, but, uh, I, listen, I, I, I've been saying this for years, and for folks that have known me through Copasan and through Associated, you know, I think there's a significant void for mid-level management training here in our, in our industry. Mm -hmm. you know, and, it's, you know, and I'm sure nobody listening today has ever done this, but, you know, Jimmy, you, you take uh, your best technician always makes your best service manager, right? Yeah. You know, so how many times have we taken Peter our best Prince technician and made them a service manager because you needed, you were yeah. growing your business? Yeah. And the bottom line is, as leaders, you know, I think part of our job, and Matt was really great at this, is supporting us to give us the right tools, mm -hmm. you know, that we needed to be successful. And as leaders, I think that's part of our jobs to make sure that we are giving our, le you know, our future leaders the right tools for them to be successful, to be able to do that. And, you know, I've, I've been able to do that over, you know, a 16-year career now in, in the pest control industry. So, you know, I'd be interested in that. I'm a sports guy. I always said that I wanted to be a football coach. I guess now I could be a business coach, right? Who knows? So well, there's good news and bad news. The, bad, the good news is we've got a ton more questions. The bad news is I have been commanded uh -oh. to wrap this up at the end of the hour. Sorry, Dylan. So we're going to, I'm going to thank my fine guests for coming down, suffering the Mexican, enjoying the beautiful weather Puerto Rico. This is people. horrible. It is. I appreciate the two well, of you guys. Thanks for having us. Down. It's a pleasure being here. Well, I'll be back here momentarily. My name is Jeffrey Bain. I was third generation in an almost 100-year-old pest control business called Bain Pest Control Service. My grandfather emigrated from Russia, the Ukraine area, in the early 1900s. He started as a window washer and brass cleaner and started thereafter doing roach work. I started in a service role, so I was in the field, and then I got into more of a technical role and I was still in my 30s. My father said, just go to town, get it done, and I trust that you can manage the business. That was when I started building the team that I thought could help us grow and also deliver the quality of service that I wanted to maintain. The idea of selling the business wasn't in my mind until about three years ago. Then I started talking to associates in the industry, other companies that had finished the process and sold their companies. I was looking for the Ferrari, not the Ford Pinto. The one name that kept popping up was Paula Potomac and what he had done to maximize their asset. So I, I hired the Ferrari. I'm trying to kind of step back and relax a little bit more. When we bought the farm, the one thing I knew when I got here, I could relax. I could forget about the rest of the world because I still worry about my business, but less today than I did a month ago or six months ago or 10 months ago. It was a good fit. It was fun. I enjoyed the process. Sometimes it was a little bit stressful, but Paul and Frank Owen, I got to meet PB later on in the process. They're, they're very calming influences. They've gone through it enough, and they knew I was anxious about a lot of things. Paul does a great job. You know, he really understands how far he can push the strategics or the acquirers. The truth is, the day we closed, I was comfortable with who bought the company. I was comfortable with what Potomac did for me. They really made the process much easier. It gives them satisfaction to know that you walked away a friend and a happy client. All right. Well, listen, I appreciate everyone sitting and listening to us here down live in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Jim and David, thank you for joining us. In closing, we ran a little bit long today. I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some key takeaways for you. First off, you heard from some folks on the buy side as well as me on the sell side that clearly there was a speculative frenzy last year in 2021, especially the back half of the year, which is why we did Supernova. The transaction multiples here in 2022, the good news is the market is still resilient. I mean, there is clearly a lag between what goes on in the public equity markets and the private markets. So 
you haven't missed the boat. There's an opportunity to get out the door. Uh, but the main folks that are at risk here are, are you older time, old timers that are, are thinking, hey, I want to do this for another six to 12 months, grow this business, and then ultimately try to sell it a year from now. You might be okay, but there's a significant risk that you were going to miss the boat. And I'm not talking about miss the boat in multiples mean revert to one or 1.5 times revenue. I think the real risk is, you know, falling off 30, 40%. And, you know, think about it. If you own a $10 million business, 30 to 40%, that's three to 4 million bucks. That's real money. So it's something that you need to, to, to be cognizant of. The good news is we're out here. We're Potomac. We can help you. Um, we make it very, very easy to work with us. In a lot of ways, we're waving up front fees for folks to come on in and We'll bring a preliminary valuation to the table and you'll be one of the first guys to get the email that says sell now, which most of our clients benefit from last year when we had the most spectacular year from a valuation perspective in the industry. So before I leave today, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Jessica. She's going to give you a number and you can track us down. Jess, yeah. what's our number? Those of you who want to reach Potomac, you can reach us at 267-242-8132 or send us an email at pest.potomaccompany.com and I look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us and you'll be getting a commentary from me in the next week or so that I'll have charts from this show because I know everyone's going to ask me for them. So hold your horses, you get the charts and we're going to be doing the drawing and Patrick will be announcing who the winner is to the trip to Puerto Rico on the boardroom buzz. Thank you. <laughs>